and I'll tell you when we get there. We are live. Welcome everybody to Vintage House. I'm your host, Lori Branch. What's up, what's up? We got Lauren Lowry in the house. Woohoo! And our special guest for the evening, promoter extraordinaire, Reggie Corner. Reg Reggie's been wanting to get on the show for a minute. Now, Reggie's been Reggie's on the show twice the before. Show. Exactly. Once. With a team of people. <laughs> once. Just, Just once. One time. Okay. One time. See, your and presence is so large that we and thought was true. <laughs> yeah, we had a whole lot of, we had a conversation, but it was about something different than what actually I don't know what we was talking about. <laughs> I was talking about all the promoters. So you were there with, uh, you know, with a gang of other promoters, including Kevin McSwain, if I'm not mistaken. We, there was with a Kevin, John Hunt, and uh, Kirk, but That's Kirk right. was one of the hosts. Right, and Kirk was hosting. Kevin was there as well. Was Lori? Everybody was there. It was like a party. We, we had a big party. So tonight we're going to have another party, but it's going to be much smaller. Because we I get Reggie wait. all by himself. Yes. I know those of you who are watching want to hear what he has to say. I do too, because Reggie is going to keep it real. He has been advised by the many people on his Facebook feed to Reggie tell the truth. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so don't sugarcoat. So uh yeah, we go we are Jamie three two six. He took a nap. So he could uh, like see what's happening tonight. So he could tune in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Greetings. There you go. Right. That's serious. You got a little shout out from CJ. Thanks for checking us out, CJ Jones. Uh, listen, we are excited to bring Reggie to the house. He is, I talked to someone today who called you a fixture back in the day when we were starting this thing called house music. Uh, and I think back then, there it is. That's the person who called you that, Kevin Abdullah. Is that your brother, Kevin, in the, in the shot? He kind of looks like you. Oh, that's Colin Kaepernick. Oh, <laughs> y'all kind of look alike. Linda Red, what's happening, girlfriend? Thanks for checking us out. But Reggie has been around the block. Uh, he has been a fixture in Chicago house music. Uh, I would say in our scene. Uh, certainly pre-house music. He was a regular at the Music Box. He was regular at Sours. Uh, started doing parties uh, with his crew very early on. So we're going to get a look into his history. We're going to talk about what's happening now. And certainly a little bit of the noise that's going on in the community. We've, we've touched on this in previous shows. And I think that's what spurred this conversation is that uh, I think you, you wanted to set some records straight. So we'll get a, a chance to do that too. Is that, is that a fair assessment, Reggie? Yes, yes, definitely. Good, good, good. What's up, Tawana and Reggie Tawana, Davenport? Tawana was, one of the, Tawana was from the beginning. Dunbar. We used to do a lot of parties at Dunbar. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go there. So before we get into the noise in the community, because I know you want to talk about that, just for the sake of our viewers, since we have you by yourself, let's hear Reggie Corner's story, when and where you entered, when this thing called house music or disco or punk or sort of the predecessors to what we know as house music. Can you tell us a little bit about your story, Reggie? Well, where it all started from. I'm from 22nd Estate, which is the Ickies, and Sowers was down the street. Um, playground was down the street. Uh, first impressions was down the streets. So many different clubs. I mean, even in Jewtown, that wasn't too far. Everything was kind of like what we call like in the Mecca. It was like in the circle around in that area. So I started going out with someone that you know uh -oh. very well. A uh, few of my friends from the Ickies, we used to go out a lot, which was uh, Julio, which is AKA, uh, Real name Dwayne Stepper. Okay. Uh, Dino, AK Dino, Harold Price. Uh oh. Okay. Spanky, which is James. So, yes. I was kind of, and it was a few other ones, but that what was. What year was this, Reggie? What year was this? 80. 1980. Sort of the same year we were all kind of hitting the scene. 
Yeah, we all kind of entered high school around that time. And, uh, you know, some of it around in 79 because we would go by uh, Sowers within the neighborhood. That's like, what, four blocks away. So even we wasn't old enough, we would still go by and be nosy. Uh, <laughs> but that was kind of how we started going to different parties around mm -hmm. the city. So as we would go around the city to different parties, we end up meeting people in from all over, west side, north side, south side, everywhere. Um, so that's kind of like what was the birth of us going to the parties, because it was in our neighborhoods. Talk about a little bit about the parties. I think that uh, many people who watch the show weren't there. And sort of a lot of this, the, the noise that I was referring to earlier is about the kind of who was there and who wasn't there because there does seem to be kind of a longing to want to belong to that period. I, I mean, I think of it for ourselves, it's like us wanting to be part of Studio 54 or Paradise Garage when we didn't live in New York or we weren't there, but you know, just the legend of it is enough to want to make you wish you were there. So what, what, was, it, what was happening at that time that made it so attractive for people want to keep revisiting it and for those who weren't there to wish they were there? What was wow. happening? I would say for we kind of went in the beginning because there was a lot of different people that wasn't actually from my neighborhood. So we was just venturing out. And for us, there was a lot of different women that wasn't from my neighborhood. Okay. Uh, and the music was the background. And then we started listening to this music and it was like, man, I hear this in my house. I'm the youngest out of 10. So a lot of that disco, I had to listen to whatever they played. So some of the music that was in my house that wasn't necessarily played on the radio was at the party. So I was familiar with it. And we liked the dance. So that mm -hmm. was the thing that brought us to the parties. And I mean, that's pretty much what it is, you know, meeting a lot of people from all over the city that we never, you know, it was just like opening up a can of worms. They would mm -hmm. meet people from all over the place. I Talk mean, about, I, go ahead, Reggie. Sorry. I got, I mean, like Kevin, Kevin's from Mount South, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I wouldn't have never met him if, right. you know, if I didn't attend those parties, you know, from Kevin to Hans, his brother, you know, Al, all of them, they was the rude boy. We was the fly boys. Uh, Lee Collins, you know, he was from Dunbar. I went to Phillips. So I did, I hung out at Dunbar a lot. So they kind of like thought I went to Dunbar. Played football for Phillips, but a lot of football players at Dunbar was friends of mine, but they was preppy. So that kind of had the connection. Plus then the, you know, the attraction from, you know, the clothes, the style, the music. Then I met people from the north side. Mike Jones, Keith, Tara, you know, Peppa, Wolf, all of them. They was from the Lincoln Park area. Linda, Linda, and all these. Uh, TT party all the time. So there was, it was adventurous to go all over. Who was in the Fly Boys, Reggie? Who was who were in the Fly Boys with you? Uh, me, Lee Collins, Billy, McClinton, Julio, James, Spanky, uh, Eddie, uh, Joe. Who was a bunch of us? Charvis, Charvis, you know, see, that's what was so great. Charvis was from Oak Park. We would have never met him, you know, due to the from park. Oak Park. That's yeah. interesting. Kevin so McClain. Kevin McClain. Interesting. So y'all just kicked it at the parties. Y'all just went to all the parties and, and, and danced and hung out? Yeah. I mean, we kind of met each other at the parties. And, and, and me and Mike Jones was talking earlier about some of the things about... Uh, you know, he had put on a flyer that was up, uh, you know, keep it real 100. You know, the parties was, it was a preppy crowd. You know, Mike was from the Pagrini Greens. We from the Yankees. We just 
came onto the scene and it it was kind of bougie, you know, preppy, and they had their clicks. And okay. he was talking about nowadays, the difference is, is that people are not accepting people. I said, it wasn't no different then. We came okay. from the projects. We made our own way. We didn't have to be accepted by the crowd. We came for the music. Right. We didn't come to be liked. Do so, you feel you felt that there were cliques even back then that um, that were based on class or where you were from? Did you can you talk about I, that a little bit? Well, you had the high parkings, you know, the Kenwoods, and mm -hmm. you know, there was a difference with people from what was out over east, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the Beverly Hills area, uh, but. The schools that was promoted to for these parties was like the Catholic schools or what you would call the good schools. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't really promoted, you know, to do solvable, you know, Western House, places mm -hmm. like that uh, mm -hmm. until later on. But in the beginning, they kind of kept it with the Catholic schools in the, you know, the Kenwoods and High Parks and Unity and uh, places like that, you know, cathedrals, all these different places, those kids would come to the parties. Right. So they would click because they knew each other from schools. Exactly. They went to school with each other. Uh, so they might have been introducing each other, but they mm -hmm. it was still a click. But right. we feel like we had to belong to the click. You know, and one of the things is back then you could come into the clique, but you had to be introduced by someone. Okay. Did you join a clique? Did you, I mean, did you stay uh, sort of the Icky's clique or or what? Who was your clique and, and who was comprised of it? You name a few names, but, but how did you engage the other cliques? We didn't really engage. We just met people from all over. I mean, like I said, Charb is from Oak Park, right? How did we meet him? You know, Kevin, Hans, they was from out south. You know what I mean? Uh, Lee Collins, he stayed out south, sort of, and in the hundreds. So, you know, we had Curry, Kent, they was, you know, from King. We met people from different schools all over the city. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was just because we just kept it real. We was open to anyone. Mm -hmm. And the difference is just like now, it's easier to get into what they would call the in crowd right? versus back then. It might have, you know, it was kind of hard. They didn't accept you because you didn't go to their schools or you didn't live in their neighborhoods or nobody introduced you to why are you talking to them? You know, uh, look at his clothes or whatever it is. You know, you just couldn't get in back then. It was harder. But we, we made our own because we accepted everyone. So it was so like you had no choice. You had to deal with us. Right. I like you know? that. I, I think that, uh, you know, this is going to be the theme of the night. I think this sort of you have to make your own way. And we're going to talk about that in a bit, Reggie. Uh, but Kevin wants to know about the softball game. <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> you want to play another softball game, or is he talking about the softball game, uh, the music box versus the uh, the power play? I'm guessing it was that one. Okay, at the Belmont Rocks. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, what do you want to know? He was there. Okay, what do you want to know, Kevin? Well, I guess it was a. It was a. Let's talk about the music box because that is a place where you know a lot of people sort of draw the line on sort of where you started. And was the warehouse a part of your experience or was sort of the music box? So you were kind of more in the music box camp. I know that Robert Williams is a friend of yours. Um, so just curious about your, your history, you know, with that scene, that part of the scene. The warehouse, we was a little young, mm -hmm. uh, but we went to the warehouse. Okay. Uh, the first time I went was with Gino. Uh, some people call him Dino, you know, but, uh, he was like, man, we got to go here. We got to go here. So um, it's like, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. We used to go and hang out. Like after sours, we would just kind of pile up in the car. I remember one time Kevin Abdul was in the car with uh, Charvis had a, a Camaro and it was nine of us in the car at one time. Wow. And we would just go over there and kind of hang out, 
and just be outside or hang out in the parking lot. And one time I tried to get in and I was all sweaty because I just came from Sours and I was like, walked in and Brazil was at the door and was like, you wasn't in here. And I was like, how did he know that I wasn't in this party? I'm dripping wet. Come to find out that it was a membership club. So they basically knew everyone who came to that party. So he knew I wasn't in there because I wasn't a regular. Or, you know, when you work the door, you kind of remember everybody who pays. So we would end up, you know, just going to hang out. But my first experience in the warehouse with Gino was like, wow, it was crazy. You know, I just, the sounds, you know, it wasn't like it was a big old room. The sounds was all over my place, you know, all over the room. Plus it was predominantly gay. So it was like, oh shit, what the fuck am I in? Excuse my language, but that's <laughs> how I felt. <laughs> you know, so I kind of like got against the wall and was like holding there. And I seen Sheree Wallace and this guy named Ruben. Hey, Wallace, I haven't seen yeah. her and the guy named Ruben, and they just took over the dance floor. And it just like, you know, it just blew my mind. They, I mean, the whole, it, it was the John Travolta moment, Saturday Night Fever. And I was like, <laughs> you know, this is really crazy because most right. of the parties that we attended was in big halls and music bouncing off the walls and everywhere, you know, but this was built, the sound system was built for the building. Mm -hmm. so it was like being inside your car with a stereo. So it was like all over me. Although the sound system was great in these big halls, but it was still like, you know, 30, 40 foot ceilings, you know, sound bouncing all over the wall. This was a club. So it was like, it was, you know, it was a little bit different. But the music box, it depends on when you're talking about which music box. Yeah, there were two music boxes. And, uh, I and I know this I know this well because I DJed at the I was a, that was my first residency at this place called R2 Underground. So R2 Underground was owned by the same guys who owned the Ritz, which was over there like near the Gold Coast, Rush Street. They opened up a second club, Craig Cannon got me a night there. Um it's like 82, 83. And then uh it they they sold it, I don't know how it switched hands, but it ended up being the music box. <laughs> After the music box was on 13th, yeah, it was, 13th it was Street. So talk about that. Some bills probably wasn't really played. How we ended up on 16th in Indiana was because uh, in promotion, you know, when I got into the game is Butch and Craig. Butch and Craig taught me the game. Mm -hmm. I was working for them and they basically, you know, mentored me and taught me, you know, the game. So we would go from the playground, after the playground, we would go down to the music box because Robert went down there and got Donzel and Pat to work security. So we had, you know, familiar friends working. So we would go down there to hang out after the party, you know, do the playground. And then after the music box left 16th and went downtown, uh, we was, a, you know, then that was the normal party. We was a fixture, mm -hmm. you know. Wasn't no more playground for me. I mean, it was changing hands. We was a little bit older. We looked at the party. It was like, this party's a little bit more intense. Uh, the women are a little bit more older. Uh, you know, and then, you know, the DJ. You know, Ron just was on another, you know, a different level. It seems like, you know, playground was like the kiddie place. Yeah, so yeah. That's how I remember it. Yeah, and then when we went to... You know, it was like, hey, this is for the grown folks. Mm -hmm. Although we not grown yet, but we was always doing things with people older than us. Even when we went to the parties as a teenager at 13, it was still, we was hanging out with 15 and 16 years old. Yeah. So was, I, I think you're making an important distinction because it's not something we talk about a lot. But, you know, the the music uh, the music box and, and the, and the uh, warehouse was... A, a, an older crowd and the playground and and sours playground was even younger like sours sort of was like a bridge crowd you know you had yeah, some people the, who were a little bit older go ahead because of the college students right they will go and especially you know a lot of the holiday parties 
So they will come home and mm -hmm. this is where they will go to. Uh, right to Cyprus. So, That's exactly yeah. the flow. Yep. So that was like the difference in, you know, the parties. You know, me and Robert always have this, com you know, this argument about, well, this party was more intense than that. I was like, Robert, some of the same music was played. The difference is they was older. This party was a little bit more intense. It had a lot of things that grown folks do that the kids didn't do. Right. You know, as far as drugs, alcohol or whatever. But both of the parties played similar music. Mm -hmm. You know, the music at the music box or the warehouse was played a, a lot longer due to mm -hmm. the fact that there was one DJ and he gave you the, the whole experience of the whole song. Yes. Which, that one of the, the parties that was at one of the halls or a high school, you had multiple DJs. So it was yeah. like a battle. Who Who's going to play? You know, I got two hours to play or an hour play. I got to play all the cuts. So right. I got to shorten that up versus playing for an hour and I'm going to get three songs out of it because some songs can last 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That is such a great point that you're making. And it's not one that we ever really talk about. Like, why would some DJs play, you know, what they say, let the song breathe. And Frankie and Ronnie were good for that. But you were right. You know, they might have had an opening DJ. Mike Winston would open for, for Frankie sometimes, but that was super early. And then they played for a stretch of five or six or seven hours. Right. So they had the luxury let the song breathe. Yeah, Ron played by himself. So one of the mm -hmm. things is too is I got an eight hour gig. How do I do? You know, or mm -hmm. even longer. You know, from mm -hmm. twelve to twelve. The party didn't necessarily always last at twelve o'clock, but you know, the next day. But am I gonna sit up here and play a hundred songs in the mm -hmm. next two hours, or I'm gonna let the song breathe? And within an hour period, if I play. You know, 10 minutes a song, I got six songs out of that hour. Now, how many songs can I get in that hour if I just go for two, three minutes? Do you think that that had an impact on how people were seasoned to appreciate house music? So if you were part of the warehouse and the music box scene and you were used to a journey, Paula Matthews uh, just said, you know, that you went on a musical journey every time. And a musical journey is not like, Two, two minutes of this song and a minute of that song and 30 seconds of that song. It's really like kind of a, a it's a it's a trip that you're going on. And typically that is that are those are DJs who have the ability to flex that way because they can take they can be there all night. So they can take you up. They can take you, keep you high. They can bring you down. They can bring you back up. They have the luxury to do that. And certain people like people like us were sort of trained, you know, to listen to music that way versus people who might have been coming out to the playground or some places like that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's funny why you say that, because that's exactly what I do. People, people try to figure out and it goes into the DJ. So just a little bit early, early for us to be start talking about that. But I got to touch on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. My format and my style of a party and what I will really like but I still have to do what the public says. I would prefer one DJ only. Every mm -hmm. house needs one maestro. Yes. Because that one maestro can give you all of him. When you make music, you're making your art and you want people to hear every note from the beginning to the end. You can't do that when you got multiple DJs, mm -hmm. but you can do it when you have one maestro and he's gonna let that song ride and that's why we deal with the EQs and all that, because we take the song and we even Ron would take songs and say, oh, this is too short. Let me make it a lot more longer. Yes, he did. And let me Mikey did that, too. Yeah. That's what all the, you know, producer DJs do. That was the early start of being producers, you know, as a DJ is let this song breathe and let me give them all of the song. I just look at dancing. Dancing is sort of routine. So when you dancing, uh, you kind of want to hear a song, you know, the, the, you know, the peaks and the valleys and everything. So you Absolutely. can know what moves you can make off of that song. But if you keep changing the song on I me, mean, I can't catch the groove. The groove is, you know, you didn't change my rhythm. We, you know, it's just like when the DJ gets into that zone, a mm -hmm. dancer can get into a zone. But if you keep taking the music and chopping it and bringing it all over the place, 
you know, your zone is very short. You know, music is melodic. You know, you get off into it and then you just go to another place. And that's the purpose of it. And when you're chopping it up, I, I think the purpose is lost. That's the underground, you know, style of music of what we do. And DJs keep saying, why you don't do this or whatever. I'm McDonald's. I sell the Big Mac. So this is what I'm trying to give you. Mm-hmm. And that's why I stick to the format of trying to have one maestro per party. Mm-hmm. You know? And that tends to work for you. Yeah. And it works for me because I learned that format. You know, and the wheel keep turning. It's just about like uh, Kirk Towns was like, the wheel keep turning. It's the same. It's just when you, you yeah. know, when, when you jump on the wheel, you mm-hmm. know, what you place. If you're going to go around smoothly or you're going to, you know, make waves. Because the wheel yeah. ain't change. So maybe what you're describing is a reason that people long for something that they did not experience. Because uh, if my orientation is the music box and the warehouse, and you know the clubs like the Bitter Inn and the other clubs that were on the South Side that were sort of little, you know, maybe pre those days, but you know, helped help to inform that crowd. It was about a musical journey, as Paula was saying, and that you expected a song to be played until the end or until like a later break, so that you could get into it. I think about "Ain't No Mountain High Enough." Like if a DJ to this day, if a DJ cuts that off before the break or at the break, I am just like floored. Because I'm like, you missed the point of the song. Yeah. The point of the song will happen until like way towards the end. You know, the build like, up. So right. you know, I'm dancing and I'm real smooth yes. and I think I'm cool. And then here come this break, and then I could oh and I could snap out. And right. then maybe the song will go back down, you know. But the thing yes. is I experienced that whole moment. And when you chop it up, you take that moment away from me. And from us, from the beginning of things. Our mm-hmm. ears, we was trained that way. So yeah. that's what we do. And people are like, well, what's wrong with something new? Ain't nothing wrong with nothing new. But that's your thing. You know, and if you can make it work, make it work. Right. But this is the format that I was taught. And that's what I kind of, I'm grounded with. I, I can, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, and, I can and- change, and, you know, that 2DJ, 3DJ, you know, oh. rather than... Okay, fine, but I still think that one DJ should be in that particular house. If that's a weekly party, that one DJ that's should the point. be the maestro. But that's the point that you're making. So if it's a weekly party, that makes sense. So you do both. You you have some you've had residencies uh as a promoter. So the Renaissance is one of your places. Name some other places where you have had, you know, the, the opportunity to do weekly. And maybe you could talk about the difference in that. And then putting on an event because it's, it's you have to do you have to handle that differently, right? I have to. My memory's bad, so I will probably have to go in my drawer and grab out all these flyers. There you go. I might be able to help you out too. Uh, yeah. Look, well, yeah. if I remember, um, starting off, I was doing a lot of you know when house music kind of got a little bit disappeared and mm-hmm. you know went a little bit deeper underground i um was doing hip hop parties mm-hmm. uh, and gino died so mm-hmm. i did a mem- memorial party for him that was 20 years ago to, you know this is my 20 year anniversary of the way we were and i did this flyer for his memorial party okay Congratulations on 20 years. So this was, I got with Robert and got a lot of the, you know, old flyers and to do the party so I can let people know we're going to, we're going to take this back. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, actually on that party was Andre Lee Collins and Sada, right? Because Sada was friends with Lee, but Lee was always been my friend since high school. So uh, residents, um, we started out doing parties. Damn, where that fly? Where did that picture come from? <laughs> Little surprise picture. Uh oh! I need to see that because it's a see that few, again. <laughs> it's a few people that I haven't seen in a long time. Okay, okay. I'm to ask you about that. that's why it's up. We we want to ask I, questions about that. Okay. Um, 
Well, starting yeah. out, we didn't do like weeklies. It was like monthlies or or every other month because mm -hmm. the scene wasn't strong enough to keep the party going. Mm -hmm. So I would do different things downtown in different places. Okay. Uh, Red No Five, I would pop up there, Club Exhale, uh, different lofts. We was looking for all kind of places. Then we did something else. Then we said, well, okay, we're going to try it. Hans called me like, man, I got this place over here on Stony Island. I'm like, okay, Hans, what it look like? I'll be through there. So we started doing a party and we call it mm -hmm. the Concrete Jungle. So it was me, Hans, and Tyrell. So we we ran those parties like once a month. And it was very difficult to get to people because you couldn't put posters up. You couldn't find people. So, mm -hmm. you know, I had already been creating from the different places I was at uh, a mailing list because we actually had to mail you and put the stamps on and go to the post office and mail them off. Um, after the Concrete Jungle, well, before we did the Concrete Jungle, I was running Andre, Jamie, and DJ Ridge as three DJs, like in rotation. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, it wasn't like they was, you play this party, but you won't play that. I would just change their rotation in the party. Like you will open up, he will close, you know, you will play the middle slot. So I just kept those three DJs because I ultimately, I wanted to have one. So when I went to the basement by myself, Jamie was the resident. But at the same time, there was people that wanted like it was something better out there. So I had to bring guests here and there because you got to hear what the people say. Because I tell people, I have never really chose DJs to come and play. The people choose who should be playing. Because if nobody's ringing, you know, talking about you or, or, or you know, excited about seeing you or hearing you play, how could I bring a DJ that no one knows? So that was sort of the start of, well, the weeklies. You want to get into the weekly. So weekly parties was kind of difficult, you know, because a lot of places didn't particularly like what you were doing. So it wasn't exactly every week. It will be a monthly party or mm -hmm. every other month or whenever holidays here and there. So I think one of my first, hmm, was that the Negro League? I think it was the Negro League. I was doing a Thursday, you know, the shrine. That was Sunday, me and Terry. Um, and that was, you know, creating did the dating game for a while. Um, hmm. Somebody need to help me. I need this so much, my man. <laughs> hey, let me see if this helps you. I wanna, I wanna share this picture again, and uh, let me know what, what this picture. Uh, let's see if I can get that up there. Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna share this picture again. Tell me about this, this group. Wow, is that that's Mark Billinger with his hand over his face? Uh. The guy with the scarf, I don't know if that's Alan. And why do I not remember this boy next with the striped shirt on? That's Philip or what is his name? I haven't seen him in 30 years. That's well, what it seems like. <laughs> do you know his name? You know, Lauren dug this picture up. Tell us about the picture. All right, right in the middle. I, I wish I did know his name. This is part of the Dance Music Collection's uh, Craig Cannon okay. well, uh, collection. That's, that's within the dance uh, music. To bring that up, Mark with his hand. Okay, Mark went to King, but Mark was from out in the hundreds, and my sister stayed out there. So Mark was one of my friends in the beginning. You know, in high school, Mark introduced me to Craig. I tell this story, but it's kind of weird. The music box might have not happened at that location if Craig would have just did what we wanted to do. We wanted to help Craig promote and we wanted to hit the streets the way mm -hmm. we, you know, the way we promoted because the playground was over. So it was like, 
let's take that machine how we how it was ran and let's bring it down here but before you know it as we was in negotiations and trying to get it done magically robert williams ended up getting the place mm -hmm. okay so that was a wrap then i was like oh well robert got it it's over with you know you out of here because craig didn't even know anything about getting people in the streets you know to come to the party it was almost you know you tell the friends and they was just coming but mm -hmm. promotion they didn't have any promotions for the r200 ground like that so we wanted to blanket the whole city with you know with posters and make it jump and mm -hmm. mark was the one who actually brought me to Craig. okay and that's why Mark so someone Hill. asked was but was butch in that picture butch yeah I don't uh, have it up no which That's butch not, did you talking butch Cassidy? i'm not sure which butch they're talking about what year was that where where were you and what year was that taken would you sort of unfortunately we can't ask craig now who of course unfortunately left us but you know, we didn't get all the details for some of these pits. That so might have been downstairs. Too. That might have been downstairs in R2 Underground because Craig okay. stayed downstairs. Did he really? Yeah, he stayed downstairs. Yeah, it was a pretty cool club. And yeah, it, it changed. Like, it changed you know, when although it became was, music box. It was crazy. You know, R2 Underground is in the basement, right? <laughs> but it was a sub-basement under that basement. Right. So lot. you remember when the city flooded and the river and all that happened with the tunnel? So you know all the buildings downtown kind of got flooded. And you was like, no, nah, they don't look like it got flooded. The basements are fine. They got basements under the basements. basements so it's, uh, it's I, I remember it. Levels down. So that picture, basically, I believe that was that in Craig's spot. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. I, I love that place. So listen, you wanted to be on here for a specific reason, and I want to give you an opportunity to clear the air, because there were things that were said, there were there was stuff you disagreed with. We talked a little bit about it on the phone before, and I think it has something to do, uh, you know, with with some things some other guests have said. But let's let's talk about what's on your mind. What is on Reggie Corner's mind to set the record straight? Whatever needs to be set straight. So let's do well, that. Well. In order to be part of the congregation, you got to go to church. All right. And Tell us what have, that means. <laughs> you got a lot of members. What that means is you got a lot of people talking about house music on the Internet and the promoters, the DJs, you know, they need to retire. You know, DJs don't retire. They just spin around. They don't get old. They just spin around. Mm -hmm. uh, then it's all a chatter, you know, that we stop in or I'm stopping people from actually doing what they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, it's not, you know, it becomes like you're trying to find out how do I become a DJ? You probably need to get a manager. Do DJs need to retire? Yeah, I just, I just asked that question. <laughs> uh, DJ. DJs don't retire. They just spin around. Herb Kent died, and he's still with the DJ. Sam Chapman's still DJ. So it's it's a sport that you don't. It's like golf. You get better as you get older. So I you have know, to but, agree. Yeah, most of the people are trying to figure out how do you get in, and they didn't change it around to like how do you get into a congregation and you don't go to church, which means that you don't attend the parties, but you just talk about the parties. And there's something wrong. Since you don't get in, now you become envious and you want to tear it down. That's why you're on the internet every day talking about, you know, people, what they're doing. Or oh, there go Alan King. Alan, you need to retire, you know, so you can make room for me. Now, I'm the CEO of a company, right? And you telling me that I should retire so you can take my job. No, you should find a way to get your job because this one is mine. And, you know, the thing is, is that how do I pick DJs to DJ? I really don't pick DJs, you know, and they say it's favoritism, this and that and another. I don't think it's favoritism. I choose DJs based on whether the people are willing to come hear them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whoever they are. I don't have to like you. 
in order to work with you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every time you turn around, there's negative and, and, and envious people on the Internet. It doesn't bother me because I use your hate for your energy. I get mm -hmm. tired, you know, I work hard and, you know, I get kind of frustrated. And then I see, you know, people putting up negative stuff that don't do nothing but giving me energy to keep going on. You know, I work hard when I'm woke. When you sleep, I'm still working. And when I'm asleep, you keep my name in lights because you're always talking about me and you mm -hmm. don't even know me. These people mm -hmm. are not part of the congregation because they don't even go to the parties. So why does it bother you? It doesn't bother me. It bothers other people because they are, you know, potential people may come to a party, right? Mm -hmm. And they may say, well, I ain't going out because it's nothing but bullshit and house music. But mm -hmm. it's not. You fail to realize the reason why I go to a party is to hear music, not mm -hmm. to see you people. If I, you know, congregate with some people, that's fine. But I'm there to hear this music. And most of these DJs, or want to be promoters or whoever they are. Most of them look at something that they want. And since they can't have it, it's got to be somebody else's fault. It's not my fault that you're not DJing. Right. It's your fault because I don't know you. Make me know you. Okay. Make him know you, people. You know, and then uh, look, if you're on the internet and you're DJing and you're throwing a picnic, you think that's the format. Because you watched other people and you figured that, man, I'm going to throw me a picnic and then I'm going to get recognized or I'm going to be live on the internet and they're going to see my music and hear my music and they're going, man, now they're going to put me on. You got to put yourself on. Yeah, yeah. And most of those I picnics ain't going to work anyway. That ain't going to get mm -hmm. you no shine. That right. give you 15 seconds, but what's that going to do for you? I agree. I how do then how do people reach you though, Reggie? How if there's you walk some up to me, there? you walk up to me and say, Man, how do I get on? Then maybe mm -hmm. I'll tell you how you get on. Now I'm telling you now how you get on. The people are the ones that put you on because they're gonna talk about you, man. This man cold, she's cold, she's hot. You know, we throw on a concert, you put out a hit record, we bring you in. So mm -hmm. the difference is you hot. I have no choice but to put you on it. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the record industry. And I think there's something about the DJ world uh, that people have a different set of expectations about. So like if, if you are, if you're not like selling records or if you're not sort of, you know, making money or making waves, you know, doing something already to get attention that you've generated yourself, is you're not likely to open for like some band, you know, on the road. You know, you're not you're not just gonna get, be able to talk to somebody and say, "Can I open?" <clears throat> it's like you gotta have a track record before you get there, and that takes some time to do. Yeah, most people are not gonna come out the gate and just you know. They pop want off. it overnight, and they think that okay, you want me to do a party with three people, right? Give me three people. I'm gonna put them on a ticket. And I'm gonna promote it like it's crazy. Now, what are people gonna do? Are they gonna pay attention to this and say, okay? I'm gonna go to this particular party, right? Why? I don't know these people. I haven't heard them before. Now you may have some people that's uh, you know, want to hear something different or they're curious and they may go. But the bottom line is, if that's gonna be enough to pay the bills. How do how do Timmy McGallis just say how how do I uh, how do I get on, Reg? How does he get on? How do he get Timmy on? Walked in. <laughs> Tell Timmy, give Timmy a little lesson right hey, now. Listen, Timmy already know the lessons because actually I hung out with Timmy uh cousin from that's been my friend since we've been kids. You know, uh she's one of the the beginning and the start. So he knows how to get on. Timmy just I think he is a little bit hard headed because he wants to do what he wants to do. Now he may not he may disagree with me. What do you think, Timmy? <laughs> he 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 wants what he wants, right? So he plays the music that he wants to play the way he wants to play it. So we have to create a crowd in the audience for him. Okay. But the audience that actually go out, there's different kind of audiences. So you choose what you want to play. People say, well, new music, old music, in between. You got to have your own format. Right. Because the commercial music, right? 
house music that's commercial. That's the biggest crowd, but they would not come out every day. They may right. come out once or twice a year, but that's the biggest crowd. So if you go to a commercial party and play something different, you ain't going to be invited back. Now, the crowd that goes out every day of the week are people who want to hear new in between and old. Okay. People that want to hear new music, they don't go out as much. And it ain't that many of them. Now, when you go to another one, when you go to a kind of eclectic, you know, B-side, the Dirty Dozens, that's a smaller crowd. They don't come out very often. But when they come out, they go out. So if that's the lane that you choose, then that's what you choose. It's just like I hear these cats talking about techno. Well, house music came from here and, and EDM. What does that have to do with anything? You're not playing EDM. So how can you get EDM money? There's no way. But you keep talking about where they came from house music. They're not paying homage to us. And, and what do you, I don't understand what you mean. It's a whole nother format of what they're doing. So if you, if you in that lane and you're driving, then you stay in that lane. You don't cross over. So if you decide that you want to be a commercial house music DJ, then that's the lane you do. Now, the best thing in the world to do is just like with Frankie Knuckles when we was talking about, you know, Frankie wanted to take music to the future and he wasn't really playing the old stuff and kind of the crowd was resistant and then he picked up a newer crowd. Um, he did what he needed to do for him. But mm -hmm. I would always say, well, why don't he just come home sometimes and just give us, you know, that old vibe again, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just, just, just come on back home one day. Yeah. You know I, mean? I remember that a lot that people would yeah, be disappointed and, because that's what they yeah. were used to. And he we was over the whole doing night. Time. It'd be like, maybe at the end of the night, he play a couple of songs and it yeah. was like, you know, those songs are last because it was like he was playing one record for them in 20 minutes. But, you know, we was expecting something else and got this. Yeah. And, yeah. But he people was would be disappointed. Like, I remember yeah, that. But I'm just, I look at it like this. A person that's double-breasted, that's able to do whatever, whatever you, you know, when they Rome, do what the Romans do. And then so, you'll be okay. I want to talk a little bit about Soul Freaka. This is, this is, I know this is a while ago, but I, I, I reason I'm bringing up this, uh, this flyer with DJ Alicia and Miss Nikki, whom, both of whom I love, is that I, one thing I appreciate about you is that you do, uh, you know, you do pay attention to women. And, and it's something that DJ Lady D and I talk about, a lot of folks talk about that they're promoters who often, you know, they, they have party after party after party and don't put women on. When we know that there are women who get down, you know, like DJ Alicia, like Miss Nikki, like Mimi Hughes, like so many folks who are, who are watching tonight. You know, what, tell, talk about, can you talk about your experience as a promoter as, as a person in the party scene with women DJs and, and sort of what, where are we at with that? And, and how can we ensure that women have a more prominent place? Especially ones who, who are able to bring a crowd. That might get me in trouble. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, but yeah. for us women, I, I, I recently was talking to uh, Alicia and you know, people have a lot of different opinions about things, but I look at things like this. It's my brand and my business. Uh, and I do what's best for, for me mm -hmm. because I pay attention to what the people say and I try mm -hmm. to get what they want. I, and it's not, I don't even care what you play. You can play country and Western. If you came to me and said, you can get a thousand people in the building, we're going to be doing some country and Western. But the thing is, is that, I really don't even listen to the music while DJs are playing because I'm okay. constantly paying attention to what's going on in the party and right. I'm trying to make sure everything is going right. And I don't very seldom anybody see me at a party, they know I don't stand I don't stand still too long. I understand. Uh, so would it be fair to say, Reggie, that you are not necessarily trying to help uh promote DJs? You're you're really there about promoting the party and for the party goers. It's the experience. And that is if somebody, if so, somebody comes to you, they kind of have to have have it together already. They have yeah, to I mean, have a crowd. They have to go ahead. That's something totally different. You mm -hmm. hire me as a manager, then I'm gonna manage you. But if you come to me as business, 
I don't understand how do you want me to take a hit. You know, this is a gamble. Every time you throw a party, it's a crap right. shoot. It's a but gamble. what you do is you try to stack the dice. You know, you know how you take mm -hmm. the dice, you stack them up, and then you throw yeah. them. So you're mm -hmm. trying to just stack them where you've been the odds of being in your favor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go in it half cocked, the odds are against you already. So what could you possibly do? You yes. have to choose people that got some kind of momentum in there, you know, just moving forward. Uh, and you can choose. And I have chose DJs that I actually like the way they, you know, I might like the way, you know, your style. Because I, it's, you got to give me something to work with. You know, gotcha. it could be your hair. It could be like, oh, mm -hmm. playing the music. I get mm -hmm. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you got this look because it's a difference. The DJ used to be in the background and you never saw him. You Absolutely. just heard their name. Uh, now they want to touch you. They want to smell you. They want to mm -hmm. feel you. They, they, they want to take pictures you. with you. <laughs> yeah. So I got something that I can actually sell to the people. Like you know. That. I give it up to the Wayne Powell. The Wayne Powell got this style that just make people gravitate to him. You mm -hmm. know, and it was like, uh, man, the Wayne he DJing. What 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 is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was like, okay, yeah. he came out. He got this style. That style is something that you could promote. Mm -hmm. It fits. Mm -hmm. You know, it fits on images, and and you can sell that. It's a product mm -hmm. that you can sell, and then people are intrigued about it, and then mm -hmm. they'll come. And then you got to catch them with the music. Because if you don't actually get them with the music, then they're going to leave you. Oh, that was, oh, that was garbage. You so know? people come to parties with different expectations. I, th I think you're making yeah. a really good point. I mean, like the women. I talked to Alicia, and then she was like, well, the skill. First of all, what I see in a woman, mm -hmm. right? A woman, okay. gonna win, a woman is going to win automatically just because she's a woman. Because the women are going to come to the party just because they're going to advocate for you. Mm -hmm. So I already got something I can work with. Right. Then, you know, it depends on how you look, how your hair, what you wear and all this. Mm -hmm. That's another catch. And then if you can put it down, oh, you got a package. I can sell that all day. Mm -hmm. Women are, a, you know, I mean, men look at them like, oh, it's a man's world. But a woman can bring a whole lot of flavor to the party. Mm -hmm. And a woman can hold down a residence. Without a doubt, you have plenty of them. It's <laughs> something a woman gonna win just because they gonna champion for her just because she's a woman. You got people interesting, that, and then we it becomes kind of twisted though because okay. once you make it, then here come the hate. The, yes. and it's not hate; it is envy because people don't want to see you because they can't have it. They defer, they prefer to tear it down. So yeah. that's why. We people that constantly talks crazy on the internet yeah. if it's not and they don't talk about none of these other now i know it ain't a white black thing but kind of in our community is a black thing mm -hmm. why you don't talk about these fortune 500 companies and That's you're still talking about us because you want to tear it down because you can't have it just be quiet and just accept it and move on build your own foundation and if you can't have it then move on because we study telling People, they need to retire. They old or you're not bringing in the youth. We can't bring in the youth unless they want to come. When we went to the parties, did nobody bring us? We saw it. We, oh, okay, what's this? We was curious. We right, liked right. it. We stayed. So and it, also, it's an age thing. I mean, we're like, people who were bringing us in might have been in their 20s or maybe in their 30s. You know what I'm saying? They were still youthful people. Having Being a part of the house music community now, you have to recognize that there, there is. This is an intergenerational thing, but the generations don't go down that deep. In this country, you know, in, in this, this country, country, in, and, in the country city, and in the city, and in the city, let's this, get real specific. And on and the we, south side, yeah. And then you got people that don't want to be partying with somebody that's twenty years younger than them. You know, right. so they, they right. feel a certain way about that because they got grandkids. They don't want to party with their grandkids. Then you got some grandmothers that have no problem with partying with mm -hmm. their grandkids. Mm -hmm. Oh, they great parent, grandkids. But, you know, when we we do have parties, that's a whole nother, diff, you know, different yeah. generation of people. Absolutely. But they listen to a different style of music. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. It's house, but it's different. Yeah, it's it is different. Harder. It's a little bit more on the, you know, EDM side, but uh -huh. they're younger. And music is sort of generational. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? You always gravitate to that sound that you grew up with, you know? And I that. think the younger crowd, uh, you know, when I think of uh, uh, DJs who appeal to a younger crowd who may be like semi from our generation, somebody like Superman, you know, there, there are others who, who understand that you have to have an open format. And if you're going to be playing house, it is not 10 minutes of a, of a track. It is it is not what we, what you would be promoting, Reggie, or what the things that we And that's like. my thing. Don't be asking me to DJ and that ain't what you do. You ain't playing right. a record for 10 minutes, right. but you want to come in and change my format because you think I'm hating on you. I really don't know you. I'm doing what I do. And if you can fit into the format of what I'm doing, then, hey, we might be able to make it. But when you come in and try to change, you know, it doesn't make sense. Right. Timmy, I agree with you. You don't retire from music. DJs don't retire. And I knew you were you were in jest. So I, I knew. Yeah, I, I mean, well, you know, it. they come up with these formats and what they thought was going to work. OK, let's get into a DJ group. Right. What is a DJ group? You know, what I mean, why would I want to be into a DJ group when it's an individual sport? When I go up to play, I want to play every day of the week. Why mm -hmm. would I have a group of DJs when it's my turn to DJ? I, what you ain't it's a different it. kind of party though i mean yeah. so when you have chosen few for example doing a lunchtime jam it's a one hour party and there's three djs you know or or when uh tracy wah have me and celeste and two other women you know djing for or you know first lady on a lunchtime jam you got 20 minutes so you have to make it this is about an entertainment sport yeah so we're gonna do you're gonna do two i'm gonna do two and so this is about like a little relay race and people are going to get into the rhythm of what we're trying to do. It's not about an all, all night party. So there's but different styles of different time. parties. No, it doesn't. A, that's a specialty party. And when you have a party that's a specialty party, you do that. But why would I, I'm deciding right now I want to be a DJ. I'm not going to get into DJ crew because this is an individual sport. This is golf. I may have some people around me, my caddy or whatever the case is to push me, but I'm not joining a group because you are gonna hire the whole group, which means that I'm not gonna make the money that I'm trying to make, or I'm gonna lose gigs because it's your right. turn. I'm trying to work every day of the week because yeah. this is what people don't understand. There's some of us that have sacrificed and was and is blessed to do what we love. There's a lot of people that have a day job, but they <laughs> want to be a DJ, mm -hmm. or they mm -hmm. say they a DJ, right. and they want to quit the job and just be DJing. Right. But you want to tell the guys that actually made the, sacri the sacrifice to become a DJ and live that life right. to quit to make room for you. It's an individual sport. I am right. doing it for me and my family, not you and your family. Right. You're well, making a good point. That. Go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. I'm a little curious about that. First of all, I love your point about DJs having style, sort of using Dwayne Powell as an example of that, and then using some of the women DJs as well. You know, something about their style, their hair, something that they do. Um, so how is it you know so like now do you think there's a style because back in the day it wasn't like the chosen few had a look or something they were a team they were a group like you're saying now is sort of obsolete to a certain degree because if people want to get on and get on all the time and make a living out of it maybe they can't be in a group but what is it about style what is it what can they do to you know like what are the things that you're seeing that give a, a particular dj a style what should they be striving to how to set themselves apart well, what I think is, is that when you look at the chosen few um, and you're trying to come up and use them as, as an example of how to make it, you know, Batman and Wayne and, you know, in the beginning and when they was doing, they basically was throwing parties and they was actually throwing their own party. So they was the DJs of the party. So it wasn't like, you know, people was hiring them outside of that but they was basically throwing their own parties and putting their cell phone. So you can't use that as an example of how to make it unless you do the same thing. Get your group and throw your own parties and see what comes out of it. 
but you can't use that as example if you're going to make it at the end uh, individual and you can't have no 30 40 djs talking about we're going to be sharing this box because it's not about that you have to have the small niche of people and if you throw a party you guys are the only ones going to be djing mm -hmm. because people get used to your sound and yeah. they want to see you you are an entertainer, so you entertain the same thing. If you go, you know, you remember Frankie Beverly and uh, Mays used to come to Chicago every holiday. Mm -hmm. The OJ, every holiday. It was a staple. So you're a staple. You do what you do. Now, as far as people hiring, you know, mm -hmm. picking up on you and hiring you to do different gigs, that's your momentum. When we see and hear somebody's hot, we want a part of that. Because we know we could put this package, you know, you see that right now it's three of us on here. Okay, mm -hmm. that flyer look nice. It's dope. We all DJ. I'm going to take this flyer, make it, put it on there, and see mm -hmm. if it sells. People going to mm -hmm. be like, oh, okay, Lauren. Oh, Laurie, Reggie. Oh, I'm going to that party. That's what I'm trying to put together, a package mm -hmm. that's sold. Now, mm -hmm. if, you have, if I got a, three people that nobody recognizes or knows, or three people that they haven't seen nowhere but on the internet, they're going to be like, oh, I ain't yeah, going to that. Going to that. <laughs> and, and, and that's not what I'm trying to do, you know? Right. And the chosen few, they don't understand. The chosen few was individual DJs right. that was already made and working. Yeah. So know, Alan is, Alan is uh, commenting Alan. here. Yeah. That he's uh -huh. not always done. I said, Alan's commenting here. Thanks for the comment. Uh, we've always done our own thing and put our own oh, well, self. Alan, get on out of here. Self. Alan, I heard you. <laughs> Alan was on the interview and the DJs was like saying some things. And Alan said, I understand their frustration. Uh, I can't understand their frustration because how can you be uh, uh, frustrated about some stuff that you are not actually, you know, it's not your right. You have to earn it. And if you do work hard, see, a lot of DJs say, I know I'm cold. I be beating the box. Wrong. People have to say you be beating the box. That's true. That's how you get on. Not by you tooting your own horn how great you are. Somebody has to talk about how great you are. And it can't be one or two of your friends. It has to be people, period. It has to be a legitimate surrogate. Yeah. Somebody who, who, who is taken seriously. And 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 that's what that's be happening, man. They just hating on me. I know I'm cold. How do you know you cold? I haven't heard nobody say you was cold. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and, and that's the thing. It's just like, you know, you frustrated for no reason. Now, if you mm -hmm. want to sit down and talk to me, and I can give you some pointers on maybe what I think that might happen for you if you mm -hmm. do this. You know, I tell DJs pass out CDs until you just can't pass them out no more. <laughs> Does you anyone know, ask you for advice, Reggie? Yeah, some people don't want my advice because I, I I I have a problem with uh I I I can't really lie. I just tell you how I feel, you know. So are I you kind of like the Simon Cowell of the house music? Like you're just not going to hold back. You're going to be like, you know what? You shouldn't do this. I mean, that's I, I mean, I'm gonna tell you an honest opinion. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't sugarcoat it because it just it just ain't in my DNA. I feel like I'm lying to you if I don't tell you the truth. If I don't okay. tell you actually how I'm feeling, it's sort of like I'm lying to you, and that and it, it kind of eats at my gut, you know. So it don't be no harm. You know, people say I'm straight ground beef, you know, Chuck. You know, right. I don't have no filter, you know. And yeah. you know, I can say it, but I feel good about being able to talk to you. And you can tell me I'm wrong and then I can understand and come back and say, yeah, I was wrong. But I might not let you know I'm wrong, but I'm not going to do it again. You know, uh, but when I tell you something, it's from the heart. It ain't from no hate or something uh, that I just magically came out, you know, and not trying to help you. I know DJs are trying to. It's kind of hard to get on in the first place. And it has always been hard. You have to be in a certain situation. You know what I mean? Somebody has to take a liking to you, maybe. You mm -hmm. know, but how could I possibly take a liking to somebody that's constantly on the internet talking negative? Right, right. Don't nobody want to be a part of that. And then, then you know, we have different things. People are upset at you for several reasons when you throw a party. I can't get in free. You know, people feel entitled. I, I can't mm -hmm. get in free. Me? You know, 
or they want to sit in the DJ booth while the DJ is working. Why are you in the DJ booth? This yeah, person yeah. is working and concentrating and you're trying to have a conversation. Really, you're not. You're just standing there so you can get some of that shine. Right. So I, you have, I have to agree with you. That is that oh, is you know, much as I love the man tip, it's a little bit annoying. Yeah, it's but then they get mad at me because I asked them to get out the booth. <laughs> because that <laughs> person so is working. You know, I don't come up to your job and stop you from working. So why would you stop the DJ? I don't really understand. Well, yeah. that. I'm always wanting to be a friend. I always want to be You're, you're yeah, annoying for some reason. Come on back on. Don't be scared. Say that again. I'm taping this on another medium as well. But, you know, so y'all talking about me, the person who always wants to get in free and, of course, must be must chit chat with the DJ the entire time. So y'all talking about me and my friends. It's me. Well, now I'm going to make you a DJ and I'm going to make you the promoter of the party. You you spent your money, your time and your hard work to put it together. And it's a production that you put together. And then the people want to come in for free. Shouldn't you yield some kind of return off of your investment so far as the dj booth now i'm gonna make you a dj and you concentrating trying to figure out what you're gonna play next the blends or whatever and here goes somebody's trying to have a conversation while you got the headphones in one ear listening to the monitor and you can't understand what they're talking about but they sitting up here bothering you now you're going to tell me what kind of sense does that make mm -hmm. Keyword. So now you got to understand wow. some of these things you have to take yourself out to and put yourself in their shoes and see what the problem is. Because one of the things is, what would you possibly want to talk to the DJ and being standing in the booth when this party is supposed to be about the experience in the music? Because you're trying to connect to the power. Anytime that you're in a, in a space where the power is, you want to be close to that, where the real the energy is. And I mean, I, I have to say when I go into a, a party, if I know the DJ, you know, I want to at least like, you know, just do sort of eye, eye to eye contact. Like I see you. I appreciate you. I like when people do it to me. You know, I want to get, you know, it can't be all night. And sometimes I, I have been places where I had to actually have somebody like stand there and like rebuff people when it's a big crowd, like a thousand people or two thousand people or something. And I was like, I, I just need you. My friend Anise used to do it. Just stand there and just ask them what they want, you know, because it can get annoying, but it could also give a DJ energy. I don't know, you DJs, yeah, Alex, you're, you're still, watching. You, you know, know you sp sounds pretty you cool. Speak, you speak and say your piece and move on. For yes, that's party, what you do. You that's what you do. Stand there and just take up all the energy. You know, you just stand right there and then you just, you ask him, what's that record? What this and this? Come on, man. This ain't school. Get away from here. Because it takes your concentration off of what you're doing, especially when you're in a zone. When you're in a zone, I, I ain't even going to walk up to talk to you because you're right. in this space. And you know, I don't want you to get out of that space because you feel you're about to be, you know, make this room and it's about to explode because right. you didn't got to that place where you was, you know, finally or whatever. You might have walked in. It might take you an hour. It might take you 10 minutes. You know, but once you get into that groove, you don't want nobody messing with that groove. Yeah, and yeah, as a yeah. promoter, it's, it's you can recognize when that DJ is in that space and you want to protect them while they're playing. Right, right. Yeah, Jamie, uh, I agree with you. Sometimes the booth is the VIP room, co check, purse check, and photo shoot op. <laughs> yes, sir, I would and, agree. And back in the day, it's just that they don't understand. I come from another era, right? Ooh, well, I tried. Man. I try to give you the experience of what I experienced as a kid. The booth right. was off limits. <laughs> Actually, the booth was black. You didn't see it. You didn't go right. near it. And that DJ was able to be and do his thing without yeah. it being interrupted. But now you got to play politics. You got to do a whole lot of different things. You have to, you know, you got to be. World. Yeah, you got to do a lot of different things, but it's still that that DJ booth should be off limits and you should respect that the DJ is working. And it's not about, you know, when you walk on, you catch their eye, you say hi, you can move on. But standing there trying to have a conversation and then there's other people that want to come up and speak, you know, speak your piece and move on and go do what you're supposed to do. Go dance. 
because I thought yeah, you had that's the party that to would be good. Yeah, I to thought go you had the party to hear the music. <laughs> I didn't come. But they to, don't. They yeah. come. To, they come for a lot of reasons. You know, we just talked about this earlier. Do people come to parties just to hear the music? They Not don't. no more. They Not don't. No more. So you have to please and do all that. That's another thing about the DJs. When right. you know you have a production and you put it together and you got a weekly party, you actually want a maestro in the building. You don't want to rotate DJs, but people come for different reasons. So you got to give them different flavors now. Yes, you because do. Because they demand it. Yes, you and do. And if you don't give it to them, they won't come. I agree. And and I think we have a lot. I see Terry Hunter, uh, Alan King, uh, uh, Leonard Roy, a lot of DJs, Sheldon Randolph. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, you could you can attest to this. There is a reason why people will put different DJs in a lineup because our attention spans are a little bit different and folks come to hear their favorite DJ. So if I go to a party I mean, or, you know, I can tell you how many parties all your DJs can attest to this and you just got off and your people just got there. And it's like, well, you know, 10, 20 people just showed up and it's like, dude, I was I was on. Sorry, I missed it. They're ready to go. It's like, no, stay, stay. There's a lot yeah. of good music that, you know, we we <laughs> you might hear the same thing. Stick around. You know, we yeah, got different if you styles. Got if you got a relative, the trick is, is that, you know, these people might like this different particular DJ. And you invite that DJ to come, but your resident DJ, right? Yes. You bring the guests, but your resident is going to grab some of those people because evidently you got that resident because he must be good or she must That's be right. great. And That's right. they're going to pick off some of them people. So you do bring different guests so you can pick off some of those people so they could become mm -hmm. regulars in your party. Right. Because you know, most people don't understand. You can throw a party and your friends, you can have a great birthday party, but them people ain't coming back. The friends true. don't come to every party. I need strangers, you know, because the strangers are the ones gonna come. <laughs> your friends gonna come to your birthday party and they ain't coming out no more. Yeah, what's up, Ken? To next week or somewhere over there, you know. Reggie, That's it's so it's so clear that you are a, a mad professional at this game, so you understand all the different facets of, of having these parties. You know, I think it's certainly sometimes when you think about, you know, curating these events or having these residencies and parties, if it's a Friday night and people are coming from work or something like that right after work, then people are sort of doing a different thing. Maybe they're not coming to just party, let it all hang mm -hmm. out. Listen, they're, they're drinking. They just want some, yeah. you know, something in the background. So sort of understanding that game, you know, so the timing, the DJ, all those things are so critical Mm -hmm. for the work that you, you know, for, for what you're, you're looking to do there. So 20 years of curating Chicago or global events, Reggie, what, what, what can you teach? What can you tell other people about the promotions game in Chicago? If people are looking to do that in the future. What did right. Leonard just say? He did said, you? when's the last time people paid to enter a party in Chicago that drew 200 people? I think there are a lot of parties, Leonard, but, uh, I think, uh, Leonard, I think, I Leonard, that. you should stop being a heckler. We're trying to keep house music alive, not tear it down. So every time you turn around, you got something sarcastic to say. Stop it. You my man. Let's keep it going. Let's stop bringing up these crazy questions of why this and what this and who, when, and why. It's about us trying to preserve house music so we can take it to another generation and we can keep this going. It ain't about trying to tear it down. You know, stop it. Knock it off, man. He just that stopped it by hurt. telling you you're a great promoter. That's it. That's all. End of story. Thank and keep you, it like that. Don't talk about nobody. Be about <laughs> yourself. You know what I mean? Now, we might talk in other places. Mm -hmm. Hey, girl. So we might talk. Yeah, see, this is... see. We got to realize what we're talking about women, right? Mm -hmm. We got a woman right here. She coming, you know what I mean? Because she's keeping her head down and she's studying. You know, most of these people come in and they don't study. You got to study the DJs that's out there doing it so you can figure out what works for you. You know, you come in with your own style, but you got to take some of them styles from these other cats that's out here that's already doing it. 
and then you put it into your style and make it your very own. But to just to come in and be like, hey, I'm going to play the way I want to play. Y'all either like it, love it, or hate it. You might not make it. You know what I mean? But at least give yourself a chance by giving mm-hmm. something that the people want to hear. You know, don't think about it. Know about it. Use the other DJs as guinea pigs. I can walk in a room and you could be playing Laura and I could be like, oh, they like that record. So I'm going to take that record and put it in my rotation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Everyone does it. But Lauren, what, what did you just say? What can you give to somebody that's trying to come out here and be promoters? Yes. Uh, you just... It's a trick to that, too. It's a trick to that, too. Uh, actually, it was... You answered a lot of that question by telling people to study. Yeah, but you it, know, was, people it was... Come in, you got to study that. Yeah, but it was the answer that, and that we got to understand about DJ, I mean, about being a promoter, right? And they was like, you know, they had this thing. I think it was last year or something that came up. Uh, when did the promoter... The promoters are trying to be superstars, too. When did they be trying to, you know, like... They're trying to take the stardom, you know, of a, like DJs, right? And I was like, probably you don't understand what promoters do. Most promoters was popular. That's the reason why they got into the game in the first place. That's the start of it, you know, because you're a people person or people know you. Now you got to put a package together to bring them to a party. But you can't be an invert and actually get people to come out unless you create a brand and then you just market that brand and then you get a style of whatever the production that you're doing and you may get some people and then they tell the friends and so on. But as a person that wants to be a promoter, you got to be out there with the people. You know, you got to shake hands. You got, you know, you got to be a politician. Yes, you do. Absolutely. Like everything else. Hey, there's one thing I wanted to ask you about. It has absolutely, I don't think anything to do with anything except that I've been noticing it a lot on your um, Facebook feed. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is, let me get my application together. <laughs> what do I have on? Oh, bike ride. <laughs> you, you've been riding a bike a lot. Well, I used to be a messenger too down in the loop, right? So uh, I just, you know, the gym's closed up, closed up and I was like, man, it's time to bring that bike out. So I would go on the bike and go live. So That is so cool. That is so cool. And the trick of it is, is that I wouldn't just have put my phone up and just go live. I would take my phone and then I would use the interface, right? So it was the same thing, you know, when you DJing and you got your iRigs or your Go Mixer, plugged up or whatever and you playing the music direct so i would make a playlist mm-hmm. and ride and i ride i might ride after this show uh it's just like i gotta ride every day you know and that's great Keeps then you healthy. people start saying i want to ride you know and they kept on saying i don't know what i'm gonna ride you know what i mean it just be like something in my body i just i gotta get out i gotta go ride for about an hour you know that's good and, and I just say, well, what I'm going to do is, since people asking, I'll tell them to meet me at the promontory on Saturday if I don't have anything to do at 7 o'clock, and let's ride. Mega says, uh, definitely let him know. He didn't know you were a cyclist. He says he's, he wants to see you on the bike path. Well, that's another thing. I don't particularly like the bike path. I, you know, like I said, I was a messenger. Uh, I love riding in the streets. Oh, my Party. God. I, I agree. I it is. I love it. I love it. My That's the bike you gotta be tight. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it and, and it's not that much traffic out right now because that that would tear you crazy. But it ain't that many people out there, you know. So especially at night, it just be empty. But you know, a lot of people don't. Guys like are funny. Ride. They're crazy out here, but you know, I like to go in between cars and all that. But when I'm riding with people, we got to get on the bike path. The bike path is dangerous too because last <laughs> Saturday. We was riding, and his skateboarders was riding with his head down, and almost ran. I'm, you know, almost ran dead into him because uh, they don't be paying attention. Because we be riding, we don't just be cruising. Right. Disco you know, hockey. You got a disco hockey. So this hockey. Saturday, seven o'clock, meet me at the promontory, and we could take off and take whatever route you want to go. Maybe we'll go down to the bike path and then go downtown to the Riverwalk. 
So I got, we, we are almost, thank you for that. And we're almost, we, we actually passed time, but I did want to ask you this. How are you dealing with this pandemic? How is it treating you? I know business is not great for people whose full-time job is entertainment. So talk a little bit about that and, and how I you see things moving forward. It's driving me crazy. That's why I'm on the bike. Cause it gives me a peace of mind because it's crazy. It's just like we had a chance to open up. Right. Yeah. And then Lori turns around and close the bars that don't serve food. And when you can go downtown and you can see these people with no masks, no social distancing, and it's just packed. So why are you picking, choosing what you're doing? You either mm -hmm. open or close them all, you know, but or you come with a mandatory mask. Right. You know, because another thing, if you're thinking you're trying to make some curve, why is it that we in Blue Island or we in another suburb and they can get two, three hundred people in their clubs? They're doing that? Yeah. You can go to a few places that got a capacity. It depends on what they're saying. They're saying, well, you got to go with 25 percent of your capacity, right? Mm -hmm. That ain't what Lori's saying. 50 okay. people, period. What but Blue you Island is not Chicago. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. What difference does it make? Because the people in Chicago are going to go to Blue Island I and they're going to party mean. and they're going to come yeah. right back. Yeah, so if yeah, they yeah. There, you know, so what difference does it make? Greg, I agree. Uh, Sheldon says that he's closed. So a lot of people are closed during this, this time period. And, you know, we've taken to uh, the we internet. About, yeah, you know, we're talking about, I mean, like Clark Street, right? Yeah. Come on, what what do you what what do you? I was on the river walk, and I'm talking about the river walk goes from Wacker all the way to the lake, right. right? People all over the place, no mask, no nothing. Children, black, white, orange, Hispanic, whatever, mm -hmm. Chinese, mm -hmm. just everybody, right? No social distancing, nothing. But it's okay for them. But I get it. We do need to have some type of social distance. We do need to have a mask or whatever. Or we need to know the people that we're around, what are they doing for themselves or who they're around? Because one of the things is that the kids don't care because they don't think that it affects that. We're a little older, so we look a little, you know, different at things in health. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as we getting older, our bodies are changing. So we don't want no complications and different things. The kids, like, it's a cold. <laughs> it ain't nothing. I had it for two weeks and I'm out here. So it's a little different than them. It's left to them dying, you know. So, so they so, see things a little different. So what do we do moving forward? I mean, we're going to be, I think there's a good chance, Reggie and Lauren and everybody, that we're going to be stuck inside not necessarily inside, but we're, we're going to be stuck in this place for a while until there's a vaccine or hopefully, as, as our orange man says, it just magically disappears. He's not off. Often these flus do magically disappear. They do. So, well, this you know, ain't no flu. This is a virus. It ain't well, going nowhere. Spanish flu was pretty virulent and it disappeared. There wasn't no vaccine, not that I'm aware of. But I think that, that we have to, uh, we got to figure out what we're going to do as a community. What are we going to do? Well, what could we Keep do? I mean, we're doing a lot of the stuff is that actually, you know, that's what's really pissing me off is like, if you're going to close it, close it all. Mm -hmm. Then we can do what we need to do because we can ent entertain you over the internet. Right. You know, and we can get some type of uh, income from it. But right. when you open and close and you pick and choose, then you're not giving us much of an option. But right. if when right. everything was closed down, it was wide open. You tune into the internet and, Agreed. you know, then I, the social yeah. media companies started changing. Then they started coming out with different platforms. Mixed right. Cloud came up with their version of live. Yeah, people you know, have gotten they, very, creative. very creative. Yeah, so, but these companies did that because of the pandemic. But then when you open back up, it kind of like what we need to be on the internet for. I'm actually going out to the party. So now you shut some of the parties down. The internet is going to be something for the future anyway. Right. Running live and doing some live things. I don't think it's going to go nowhere, even when no. the city, if yeah. everything goes back to normal, if you have a good show, people are mm -hmm. going to tune into it. And I hope so. People tune into this show. Yeah, I mean. I'm your echo. 
But that's another thing. It's just like when you're talking about the envy of people, mm -hmm. it's just like when the pandemic happened and everybody started going live and then the DJs who had been doing it for years didn't get anyone to come on their shows, but a few people was hating on the ones who was going live. They don't understand. We've been innovators. We've been changing since the beginning of this thing. We have changed through the years. We never stay the same. That's you the just reason why we keep it. moving. And we stick with it. We don't give up. We keep going because we made a commitment a long time ago. And that's what they don't understand. They must didn't make a good commitment because we sure <laughs> made a commitment to stay in and do what we do. Right. You know, and entertain people. It's well, a listen, lifestyle. Well, um, I'm going to echo. Is that from you? You are. Oh. Somebody, somebody. Something turned up loud. Anyway, listen, I know there's a lot of folks who are still tuning in and, and uh, Jermaine, Leonard, Ken, uh, all of you who have been watching and commenting. Uh, we so appreciate it. Reggie, you're going to have to come back because clearly we scratched the surface and there's it's so much more. more. I mean, I have notes here that I haven't even like talked to you about. So the playground. Yeah, I mean, and so we much. got more. Yeah, he took out a whole big stack of things that we should be looking at on camera. I mean, I, I keep everything, you know, yeah. um, throughout the years. But one of the things is just like we talk about hip hop, I would do hip hop and house music, but mm -hmm. I was doing hip hop, you know, when, the, when it's just like the pandemic, the party might go back to the underground. Okay. That wouldn't be bad. That you wouldn't know, be bad. Back, mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, you know, just like we're doing, uh, you know, when I used to do all the hip hop parties mm -hmm. in house, um, it started affecting my house party because I would try to, you know, my one of the things is I was able to get in clubs because I did hip hop. So I can slide the house music again because, you know, the clubs didn't want us in there because they was like, they don't drink, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do that. So I was able to manipulate and get the things done. But I had to stop doing hip hop parties because it was affecting the house and it was two different names. It was the way we were in nightlife production. Mm -hmm. So when they, you know, shootings and fights, and it's like you you build up a night and you go through all this to build a night, and then next thing you know, it's a fight or a shooting, and the night is over. I just got tired, and then I felt like I was responsible because people that was coming to the parties, I was, you know, people potentially can get hurt based on this particular party. So I was like, well, I ain't going to be a part of it. Because y'all don't know how to behave yourself. Y'all don't deserve a party if you don't know gotta how. Do, gotta do. You Jesse Taylor, so, he in the house. What happened, Jesse? Gotta turn your phone. Gotta turn your gotta phone. Turn your phone. My somebody's, phone. Somebody's phone. I ain't got no phone on. All right. All right. Well, anyway, well, maybe anyway, a phone. Uh, I don't know why we get. Hold on one second. Okay. okay. Hey, and there it goes. Eric, Chauncey, Jermaine. Tanya, uh, thank you guys. We really appreciate you tuning in. And Reggie, 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 Reggie. Uh, I've known Reggie for, I don't know, my whole entire adult life. I can't remember the first time our paths crossed, but I know it was a long time. And I hope that, uh, if this is driving me nuts. I don't know where the echo's coming from, but I will just say, muted, that doesn't work. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, thank you guys for watching. House Music Matters hashtag. I do like that, Leonard. I know you're not crazy about the matters movement like we are, but house music does matter. Linda Red, we appreciate you. Jamie, three through six, you got to come on, babe. I know I've been chasing yeah. you for a while. So uh, let us know when you're ready. Um, yeah, it's kind of early over there. But Leonard, you said the matters, black lives um, matter. All lives matter. But at this point, we're the only people that's being killed by people that we ask to protect us. Right now. I like this. Uh, you've, you've heard about the two houses. On, there's two houses on the street and there's one house that's on fire and there's one house that's not on fire and the fire truck shows up and there's a person saying, please help me. My house is burning up. And the fire truck goes and they start to put out the house that's on fire. But somebody walks out of the other house that's not on fire but said, but my house matters too. And they're like, yeah, but you, your, your house is not on fire. My house is on fire. But my house matters too. Don't all houses matter? 
Think about it that way and how ridiculous that scenario is. And hopefully that helps people with Black Lives Matter. I mean, well, they don't like all my all lives. <laughs> all right. You know, it's just the opportunity for people to hate on Black It's okay. We all, we all about the love here. Terry Hunter, love you so much. Erica Kane, thanks for checking in. Carl Wilson, uh, Leonard, appreciate you guys. We can have another discussion about race and racism on another day. This is yeah, about love. A whole tonight. other Reggie Corner. This is about, Brown. House. <laughs> it's about house and keeping house alive. But we got to keep on touching on that's the right. point so we can, get, we can get those people that's on the fence that don't want to go out because they think it's a yes. lot of mess in house music. There is no mess. Because There's no mess. All the do. Come listen to the music, and you can't be part of the congregation if you don't go to church. That's right. One love, people. One love, okay? We got one love. Love you, Reggie. Thank you, Thank Reggie. You, everybody, appreciate you. Uh, Melody Diggs, thanks for tuning in. And we will be back next week, every Wednesday, next week with Mega. Uh, we've got, you know, we got some interesting guests coming on. We're going to have Hans actually on the show. Back with Kevin Abdullah, they're going to be talking about life on 87th Street and the Southside Club and Sours and all that good stuff. We're bringing on Aisha Mays, my good girlfriend, with Davi Davenport. Some of you guys might know that. Aisha worked with Helen Bailey, and they did some of those early parties with the Coteries. And, you know, so we got some real fun stuff coming up uh, in addition to many other guests. So keep with us. Watch Finish House next Wednesday, 10 o'clock, Reggie Corner. You'll be back too, because we just scratched the yeah. surface as always. Well, you know, from now, when I come back, I, yes. I, I, I think that, uh, like you to talk about Hans and, you know, and Kevin and Aisha, all of my friends of mine, uh, yeah. can we pair up someone you that's can. new, someone that's old? You know Let's what I mean? It. Let's bring some yin and yang together, because basically uh, all of us is the history, but we need somebody right. who in the future or right now that just we got some right now out. people we working with as a matter Thank of fact Reggie. One, Reggie one of, one of them, uh, my girl Hannah Vitti, who is who is like this amazing house music dj who's in her 20s and we met okay. because we met uh at the vintage house show when we were up in uh, evanston wnur and she's mm -hmm. going to be on the show too so we definitely going to bring bringing some new energy uh especially the new energy who can appreciate where we came from that's the important right. part. That's why we call it Vintage House. All right, peace, y'all. I love you. Thanks for watching. We will be back next week. Thanks, Reggie. All right, love y'all. Peace. Love you too, Reggie. Bye.